Is there a cure for coronavirus? President Trump seems to think so in a tweet this morning. Guys, let's dive into the science of it and talk about it. So is there a new potential cure for the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus? In this video, we are going to address that question. If you're new to the channel, my name is Zach. I'm a medical doctor and ophthalmology resident. My background is in microbiology, so I find it super interesting to talk about this kind of stuff. If you like hearing about this kind of stuff too and you don't mind listening to me ramble, consider hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel down below. So today we're looking at a potential treatment for the novel SARS-CoV-2 virus causing the current pandemic that the world finds itself in. So the basis of this video comes from a paper that was published in the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents, just less than a week ago now, five days ago. The paper was published by French authors Philippe Gautre and his team. It is a pretty interesting paper and they're making some pretty bold recommendations for treatment of the coronavirus. What this paper is suggesting is definitely interesting, so much so President Trump actually tweeted, quote, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin taken together have a real chance to be one of the biggest game changers in the history of medicine. Now that's a bold claim. Dr. Anthony Fauci, head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease and advisor to multiple presidents on matters of national health, including HIV and AIDS in the past, went on to actually rebuke this claim, stating, quote, the information that you're referring to specifically is anecdotal. It was not done in a controlled clinical trial, so you really can't make any definitive statement about it. So there's definitely some controversy surrounding this issue, but today what I wanna do is dive into this paper, take a look at the data, let's see if we can draw any conclusions from it, and whether or not this could be a potential cure for the coronavirus. So in the introduction of the paper, the authors state there's emergence of the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus from Wuhan, China. They further state that about 80% of patients will present with mild disease, mild symptoms. They go on to say that the case fatality rate is about 2.3%, climbing to as high as 8% in patients between 70 and 80 years old, and all the way up to 14% in patients over 80 years old. They do give the caveat that this is probably an inflated mortality rate, given the lack of testing and the fact that we don't really know the true number of cases in the community. They then state that their main mission with this paper is to address the urgent need for a treatment for the coronavirus and to prevent its spread in the community. They briefly allude to the new drug remdesivir, an antiviral drug, and talk about its effect in vitro against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. In vitro meaning in petri dishes in the lab, not necessarily in animal models or in humans. But remdesivir is not the medication they are talking about with this study. It's not the medication they are actually recommending as a treatment for the coronavirus. We'll talk about exactly what those two medications are in just a second. They also go on to address the anti-malarial drug chloroquine, which was shown in some Chinese studies to have good effect against the virus. Now, there's a hydroxylated form of chloroquine called hydroxychloroquine. The trade name for that is Plaquenil, and that's something you may see popping up in the news. And that medication has been shown to also have in vitro activity. Now, the safety profile of hydroxychloroquine is better than that of chloroquine. It's a medication we still use today for patients with lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and as ophthalmologists, we actually screen patients for retinal toxicity. That typically happens after you've been on it for many years or at higher dosages. The authors then go on to state that despite this medication being an anti-inflammatory medication, it is also used in the treatment of certain bacterial infections. One being Coxiella burnetti, which can cause Q fever, and another Trophorema whippoli, which can cause Whipple's disease. Now, this isn't the first time we've looked at using hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine on a virus. There are studies that have looked at the effects of these medications on the Ebola virus and the Zika virus. While in vitro studies suggest these medications can actually limit the entry of viruses into the host cell, that hasn't necessarily translated over to real world models in animals or in humans. So what is it that they actually did in this study? So what they did is they took patients with a known diagnosis of COVID-19 and they put them into one of three groups. The first group is the control group, the group that received no treatment. Those are patients offered the treatment but that declined it and so they received no treatment and served as a control group. The second group was the treatment that received treatment with hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. So those patients got Plaquenil. So the third group got Plaquenil plus the antibiotic azithromycin and they compared these groups to see who was able to clear the virus the best. Now you may be familiar with azithromycin. It is the medication in a Z-Pack, if you've ever been prescribed this by your doctor, for something like walking pneumonia or a middle ear infection. It's a macrolide antibiotic and one of the most commonly prescribed macrolide antibiotics in the United States. Some of the more common side effects of azithromycin include things like loose stool or diarrhea, but some of the more feared complications and side effects of azithromycin are things like QT interval prolongation. What is QT interval prolongation? It's basically where a medication can interfere with your heart's cardiac rhythm or the electrical rhythm in your heart. It's the repolarization phase of cardiac myocytes and it can prolong. With really prolonged QT intervals, it can throw you into torsades and arrhythmias that can be fatal. Now that's not something that is common with azithromycin, but a listed side effect is prolongation of the QT interval. If you're curious to know some of the side effects of Plaquenil, check out the video Dr. Eye Health released just today. Uh, it goes into detail on some of the side effects of Plaquenil. I'll link it down below. If you guys want to know more about the potential cardiac side effects of azithromycin, if that would be of any interest, leave a comment down below.
down below, I'll make that video. So you may be asking, how is an antibiotic azithromycin having any effect on a virus? Because antibiotics aren't supposed to kill viruses, right? Well, one of the proposed mechanisms of how azithromycin is helping to eliminate coronavirus is that it's actually upregulating the body's natural antiviral defense mechanism. One of those being the interferon pathway. It is believed that azithromycin may actually upregulate the interferon activation that allows your body to actually attack the virus. So azithromycin is acting indirectly to help your body kill the coronavirus. It is not having a direct antiviral effect on the virus. So to be included in this study, you had to meet one of two criteria. You had to be older than 12 and you had to show that you were positive with the coronavirus. The way they did that was to get nasopharyngeal swabs, so swabbing the nose, and then to run it through PCR amplification and to prove that the coronavirus was there. So you had to have the coronavirus and you had to be older than 12 to be in this study. Patients that they exclude from the study were those with any allergies to chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, with retinopathy, with G6PD enzyme deficiency, or with a prolonged QT interval. Those patients were kept out of the study. So in the study, they were able to enroll 26 patients in the treatment group, and they had 16 in the control group or the no treatment group. Of the 26 patients in the treatment group, six were lost to follow-up for reasons like getting admitted to the ICU, death, or leaving the hospital. So those patients couldn't be followed in the treatment group, so they were not included. That left us with 20 patients in the treatment group, six patients from the control group. Now of the 20 that actually received the hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil, six of those patients actually also got the azithromycin. So they got both hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. That gave us group three. They got both treated. If this is confusing, this will make a little more sense in a minute. When we look at the chart from the paper, it shows it really well. The authors state that they did control for gender, clinical status, and duration of symptoms, although this is a very small sample size, so that is difficult to do. On average, also, the hydroxychloroquine group was older at 51 years compared to the control group on average who were 37. So let's pull up the chart here, look at the data, and see what they found. So here's the chart. On the bottom are days, so days 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And on the side of the chart is the percentage of patients still infected with the virus, from 0 at the bottom, all the way to 100% at the top. And so we see as time goes by, the number of patients still infected tends to decrease with all the groups. But let's look at the black line. The black line's the control group. That's the group that got no treatment. So in that group, if we go out to day six, only about 12 and a half percent of the patients had cleared the virus by day six. Compare that to the blue line. That's the patients that received Plaquenil only. Now at day six in the Plaquenil only group or the blue line, 70% of those patients had cleared the virus by day six. Even more impressive, if you look at the green line, those are patients that got Plaquenil plus azithromycin. By day five even, 100% of those patients had cleared the virus. Cleared the virus meaning that by PCR amplification, the virus was gone, not there. That's how they were testing for that. So the authors then go on to say that for ethical reasons and because our results are so significant and evident, we decide to share our findings with the medical community. They then go on to state in the paper, quote, we therefore recommend that patients with COVID-19 be treated with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin to cure their infection and to limit the transmission to other people in order to curb the spread of COVID-19 in the world. So as with any study, it's important to look at the limitations of the study. And the most striking one in this study is the small sample size. With only 36 patients in the study, it is very difficult to have a lot of power in the study that allows us to draw definitive conclusions from the study. And that's what Dr. Fossey is getting at by saying that these things are anecdotal, they're small sample size. It's difficult to actually draw definitive conclusions from. And because there's no randomized clinical control trials, can these conclusions be made definitively? Of course they cannot. Randomized control trials take a lot of time. This was something that was done quicker and on a smaller scale, but the results all the same are pretty interesting. Other limitations of this study are the limited follow-up time, the endpoint being only six days to see if the virus was cleared. Also the loss of six patients from the treatment group is a limitation to the study and the authors allude to all these limitations. So is this an underpowered study? Yes. Is it reasonable to draw definitive conclusions from it? No. Does it bring up something that should be looked at further? Absolutely. Just because there is not a randomized clinical control trial, does not mean that these medications do not help treat the coronavirus. It just means that we can't definitively say that at this point. That being said, with the ongoing pandemic and people becoming potentially more desperate for medications for critically ill patients in the hospital, do I think doctors and physicians may start to prescribe these medications, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin to patients with coronavirus? I think it's possible. I think also these medications could become in higher demand and there could even be shortages of them in the near future. It also brings up the question of whether or not these medications could be useful for prophylaxis, either for people that would be high risk, people that are in the medical field, or even just in the general community, uh, and what implications that would have if we had such wide use of these medications. I don't have the answer to that. I don't know. I don't think anybody
body does at this point. I think it's just gonna take more time and research before we can answer those questions definitively. Guys, I don't have the answer here whether or not there is a treatment for the coronavirus, but this is definitely an interesting paper suggesting two potential treatments for it and something that I think warrants more research and investigation, especially in the wake of this pandemic. I'm gonna leave a link to the paper down below. Read it for yourself, draw your own conclusions, don't listen to me. Always read and evaluate these things for yourself. Look at these things critically and then make your own conclusions. That's the best way you can do this. I hope you guys got some value from this video. If you did, consider hitting the like button and potentially subscribing to my channel. I'm Zach with Dr. Eyeball MD. Stay safe out there and I'll see you guys in the next one.